Let's kick off with some of the players that could be on the move. We've selected six here, and we're going to start with Aaron Ramsdale. Right, James Savundra, does he need a move? I think it's still too early to say. I think we're in a situation at Arsenal at the moment where we're not still quite sure who the number one is going to be moving forward because on Tuesday night, David Ryan made two really big blunders against Luton. And we're in a situation where he could potentially be but one bad game away from Ramsdale coming back into the side. So I understand that Ramsdale will be thinking about Euro 2024. And you feel for Ramsdale because he's not let Arsenal down over the last two seasons. What he's done has been so impressive. I think Arsenal were thinking, and you can understand why, wanting to strengthen whilst in a position of strength. But it's not worked out at all. And they're in a situation whereby the upgrade they thought they were getting with David Raya, they've not quite seen in terms of the performances. They've got the best defence in the Premier League this season, but they both look nervy. Even when Ramsdale got the opportunity against Brentford, kept a clean sheet, he looked nervy. Raya looks pretty jittery as well. I think if I was Aaron Ramsdale, I would hold off for now, despite the fact he's clearly frustrated with the lack of game time. And, and Harry, would that suit Mikel Arteta? Because surely he wants two top-class goalkeepers. You sound like him, don't you, Tom? Because that's what he's been saying, hasn't he? It's like competition is good in every single position, regardless whether it's a striker or a goalkeeper. But for me, it is the one position which I think you're seeing now and you alluded to, James, that it's not really benefiting either of them. As you mentioned, when Ramsdale came in against Brentford because Rare couldn't play, there looked like this sense of trepidation. It looked like he was playing to prove himself. And that pressure is a lot for him. And then Rea has some big mistakes against Luton as well. And the issue with it is, is that as soon as either of them makes a mistake, there's so much pressure online there's so much pressure from the fan base wanting to change it up bring the other one in I feel like for both of them now it's actually not benefiting their performances and it's not creating an environment that's conducive to succeed to success for either of them so yes Mikel Arteta was adamant that he wanted competition in every position he said this was a good idea to have the two number one goalkeepers competing for this number one spot I think that argument holds more if there was more genuine rotation between the two. But at the moment, it, it just does look like there's a clear number one and a clear number two. I thought he might do something like at Brighton, where for away games, one keeper plays, and then at home, another, or in the Champions League, one of them gets subbed in. But then at the moment, it looks like Ramsdale is the clear number two. You, from his side of things, probably will look for a move away if he's continuing to not get game time. From the club perspective as well, I do think it would just benefit them now to have their number one, to go with that, to let Ramsdale go elsewhere. Yeah, I think, I think both keepers are better keepers than they're both displaying, yeah. ironically. I mean, David Rea, some of the mistakes he's making, fundamentally letting the ball go underneath him, not really claiming crosses. He'd look, it, it, it's, no, with all the biggest respect to Brentford, when you move to a club the size of Arsenal from Brentford, challenging in the Champions League, challenging at the top end of the Premier League, he's feeling that, but he's also feeling the pressure of knowing that Aaron Ramsdale is kind of breathing down his neck as well in terms of if he makes a mistake. And then Aaron Ramsdale's thinking, I haven't got much time to, to imprint myself if I get a game and I know that I'm probably going to be back out again. So he's a bundle of nerves as well. So like Harriet says, it, they both don't win. But actually, I think in the long run, I'm actually with Mikel Arteta. If he believes that there's an opportunity to make Arsenal even better by getting David Rea in the long run and he would have to go through this part of the um, bedding in period, then that would make him right. I, I get this, this part of it is not good and you don't want keepers feeling like that. Mm. But, but it has to be like that. And, and for Aaron Ramsdale as well, I do think he's too good to be um, a number two. He, he would think he's too good to be a number two. And if, you know, we might talk about it later on in the show, but if someone like Newcastle need a keeper till, till the end of the season and... I think Aaron Ramsdale's almost, he's, he's going to go to the Euros regardless because he's, he's not the number one keeper. I think he'll go anyway. But he's just too good to just sit and be number two. So I don't know, James. I, I think, I know you, it'll be better for Arteta if he has them both there in case one sort of doesn't do well. But I, I think Aaron Ramsdale could be pushing in January. I, I think we spoke about this conversation on the transfer shows in the summer. And I always thought I understood what Arsenal were doing in terms of wanting to continue to strengthen and have real depth in every single position. But when it comes to goalkeepers, it feels like a very different conversation and you are always going to be left in a situation where somebody's happy. There are players who are out of the, the, the picture when it comes to different positions, but they will get those opportunities. With goalkeepers, you're not seeing it as much. And I think, crucially, Ramsdale may feel let down because what Arteta was saying in August 
about the rotation, about there being no number one. Well, clearly, since Raya started that first game against Arteta Everton, lied. <laughs> he has been he, he, number yeah. one. Well, maybe exactly. that was the plan from the outlet. But the issue for me is that it doesn't allow either of them an off day. And every goalkeeper, every position in the pitch, they're going to have a game where they, they're not 10 out of 10. They're not even 7 out of 10. And I think that's what you've seen with both the goalkeepers. There is that element of rustiness coming in and element of nerves coming in. They need to be allowed an off day without feeling like they're going to get subbed out the next game because goalkeepers need that consistent game time. We're going to talk Sancho in a moment, Tony, Varane and Smith Rowe. But of all of these players, Flex, I mean, Calvin Phillips there is the one that I haven't mentioned. Of them all, is he the one that needs to move the most? I mean, in terms of how his move has gone and for different different reasons, you, you could argue, yes, he's definitely towards the top of that list. Obviously, there's a lot of players on there who, who need to move on. But Calvin Phillips, you know, since 2022, his arrival, he's only played 29 games in all competitions for Manchester City. I think the, the biggest disappointment for him would be when there's been big absentees in terms of Rodri, who is, you know, arguably the best in his position alongside Declan Rice at the moment. Um, when he's not been fit, Pepper's not opted to use Calvin Phillips. Away at Arsenal when Rodri was missing, he put young Rico Lewis in instead of Calvin Phillips. That, that shows Pep's thinking um, in terms of in the summer, obviously bringing in Mateus Nunes and, and Kovacic as well. Other players in that position where you've, you may have thought with, 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 with Gundogan leaving and some, some spaces opening up in the midfield for, for Manchester City, De Bruyne being out, etc., could he get some games? And it just hasn't happened. I know the infamous sort of criticism that, that Pep had of him that was a big thing. And, you know, he's, he's since actually got his head down and done some interviews since then and said I, I needed to, you know, take, take care of myself or where I was at. Um, but it just hasn't worked. I think it's clear to see. And I'm, I was really surprised to still see him there, um, even from the summer. Um, so, absolutely, I think he has to be very much near the top of that list. The similarities there with, with Jadon Sancho, who was always on that, who was also on that list, sorry. Flex, what's best for all parties for him? Uh, in my opinion, it's best that both parties go their separate ways. It's been, it's been a, a really sad, it all, what looks to be the end of Jadon Sancho's relatively short Manchester United career. I mean, I remember chasing him for the best part of... Of two years, you know, fantastic player. You've seen a good sample size at Dortmund. You can see that he was one of the most sought after wingers in Europe and it just hasn't happened. The mess that, that happened on social media with his response to Eric Ten Hag's criticism of him after the Arsenal game. Obviously, the club have, have sort of encouraged him to, to apologise. That doesn't seem to have happened yet and he hasn't been part of the squad. So, absolutely, the best scenario for club and for Jadon to get his career back on track is to, is to leave Manchester United. I think it's, it's a really sad situation that, say, Jaden Sancho finds himself in. It's fat, sad for Manchester United as well. And as you say, Flex, he's somebody that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer wanted for a number of transfer windows. He was so excited to finally get him through the door. Things didn't work brilliantly under Ole initially. And under Eric Ten Hag, he has played a, a serious number of games last season, but we've not seen that Jaden Sancho that, that we expected. And it felt like initially Ten Hag put his arm around him. He sent him off to, to Holland to try and get himself match sharp. Came back and, and really impressed, I thought, at the time, but then petered out, as United did towards the end of last season. I still would really hope there is a compromise that can be reached, but the fact is he's not played now since August. And it looks like mediation, that's out the window now. So it is a case where the club do probably need to let him go, but they're looking at the transfer fee they paid for him. Is it going to be another player that United spend big money on who ultimately leaves for nothing or Absolutely close to nothing? Will. Absolutely will be. Um, and that's another situation that Manchester United need to change with a lot of incoming change happening at board level, change coming in in the sporting director level. Those are the, these are the exact situations that Manchester United need to avoid in the future. Jane, Jane Sancho was a huge outlay, yeah. a huge investment, and kind of rightly so because of what we thought we was potentially going to get and his stock and how, how far he could go in his career and the projection that he was on. Um, but now Manchester United are left in a situation whereby if they do want Jadon Sancho to leave and he wants to leave, if both parties do want that, if you're looking at a buying club or a club who wants to loan him, they've got all the factors in their favour. Mm. A player who doesn't want to be at Manchester United, a player who Manchester United look like they want to move on, he's on very, very big wages. That makes it very, very difficult to strike a permanent deal in January. And then it also makes it difficult in terms of his wages of who's going to cover that for a short-term deal. Well, we've got three more uh, players we want to discuss, but uh, James, you've been looking at why the three we've just discussed may well be available. Yeah, Tom, let's start with the goalkeeper situation, which we've just spoken about Arsenal. It's a divisive situation for fans, despite the fact Arsenal are top of the league at the moment, despite the fact that Mick Arteta did say in August there is no number one at the club. There clearly is now. A pattern that has 
certainly emerged since David Rice started for the first time against Everton. He's played in all five Champions League matches so far, and the only Premier League match he's missed since then was when he wasn't able to play against his parent club, Brentford. And can we actually see how these two compare in the matches they have played this season for Arsenal? And there's not a big difference between the two when it comes to the number of goals conceded per game, pretty much a goal per game. Save percentage, very similar. Riot is significantly up, though, when it comes to his passing accuracy, but he has made three errors leading to goals compared to Ramsdale, who's made none. However, we mentioned about the goalkeepers being nervy, being jittery. They have underperformed, according to their XG, based on the quality of the shots on target that both have faced. They've both conceded more goals than expected. Ramsdale conceding two more than expected and Riot closer to one. So that's the Arsenal situation. We wait to see what Aaron Ramsdale does, what Arsenal look to do with him in January. But let's look at Calvin Phillips now. He joined last summer, a six-year contract, a deal worth £45 million from Leeds. But he started just five matches since then and just twice in the Premier League. And those two starts in the Premier League actually came in May when City had already won the title. Largely used off the bench, if at all, under Pep Guardiola. In total, 53 matches he's not featured in since he joined the club. So a lot for him to think about with the Euros coming up in the summer. Gareth Southgate has kept patience for so long, but can he continue to keep his spot in that England squad? The next squad in March, we'll wait to see if Calvin Phillips has moved by then. And Jaden Sancho, a really difficult situation for everybody. He's not been seen in United shirts since the 26th of August against Nottingham Forest. But since Eric Ten Hag came in as manager, he has actually appeared 44 times for the club, which is maybe somewhat of a surprise. Just seven goals, though, three assists. Compare that to 50 goals and 64 assists in what was 137 matches for Dortmund. A brilliant period there, which encouraged Man United to keep bidding. They got their man eventually. We do need a resolution soon. Will we see Jane Sancho in a Manchester United shirt again, or will we be in the move this January, we wait to see what happens with Sancho. It's a really disappointing situation for those fans and for those at the club who expected so much when they signed him in 2021. Yeah, J James, great stuff. Re really interesting there. Let, we've got three more players to get through. Let's fly through them. We've got a packed show today here on uh, Good Morning Transfers. Ivan Tony, then, Harriet. Why was he on that list and what could happen to him this January? Yeah, well, another really interesting situation. I guess it's got its own kind of factors as well. He'll be returning to the mix for Brentford in January. And I think the number one ideal situation for Brentford is that they, they keep hold of him, that they get a contract renewal. He'll have 18 months left on his contract come January. I think they'd like to see him stay, kind of repay the loyalty because they've really stuck by him during this period. However, it does look like a move away might be a likely resolution now, although Thomas Rank has already spoken about the kind of money that they want for him because he is, you know, he scored 20 in the Premier League last season so many teams looking for that proven goal scorer Arsenal have been a team heavily linked with him I think there's been a few people saying that if they had that kind of out and out goal scorer that it could take them to another level they're pushing obviously for the title this year they want to get it over the line this year very different profile to Nketiah and, and Gabriel Jesus as well so it would be a really good option for them Chelsea have been spoken about as well in that mix Manchester United I think both of those would be difficult for financial reasons and, and wage bill reasons for Chelsea as well so uh, for me it's either he stays he gets a contract renewal he spends a bit more time at Brentford and maybe looks for a move away in the summer or he does make that move over to Arsenal in the January transfer window. OK Flex, uh, Raphael Varane was on our list of six players. Why isn't he playing and could he go? I never thought I would see this one coming with Raphael Varane in terms of um, how far down the pecking order he is now and finds himself literally not playing any games and the most simple way to, to put it is that um, Eric Ten Hag sees that Harry Maguire is, is in form now and is doing the job that he wants. He did speak tactically and said that he prefers Raphael Varane and Maguire as, as right centre-backs instead of left centre-backs. So, obviously, Victor Lindelof can do that job in the absence of, uh, of, of Martinez. Luke Shaw's done that job. Johnny Evans can do that job. So, he has stuck to his principles in terms of saying he doesn't like playing both of them together. And with the upturn in form in Harry Maguire, somehow it's left Raphael Varane, who's vastly experienced, plenty of Champions Leagues, plenty of La Ligas, um, can't get into the squad. Um, and I think for Raphael Varane, he'll be looking at it, scratching his head, thinking, how have I got into a position where I'm fifth choice centre-back, I think? Um, so I think he could 100% be on the move in January, again, on big wages. Um, but for Manchester United's sake, in terms of moving forward as well for a longer-term plan, Raphael Varane, does he fit into that when he's fit? 
I believe he's our best defender. Um, but he isn't reliable with a lot of injuries. He has struggled to stay fit for a consistent period of time, even though we know his quality. So definitely could be on the move um, in January. And Emil Smith-Rowe, James, does he still have a future at Arsenal? I think he does. I think he's seen as someone really important to Arsenal's plan still. What's been so disappointing for him has been the injury problems he's had over the last few years. I mean, he started against Sheffield United in October. That was his first start in the Premier League for 524 days. Picked up an injury... And he's out now for, for a short period of time. Hopefully, he'll be back at some point in the next few weeks. And I actually spoke to Mikel Arteta when he confirmed that news at the beginning of November. And he said it was a big blow because he just felt that Smith Rowe was coming into his own, showing the form which we saw about two years ago from him. He is a brilliant player. And I think he would definitely add another option in that midfield for Arsenal. They're so dynamic in that midfield area now. And you do think there'll be opportunities for him to maybe rotate with the likes of Kai Havertz when fit. But... Because Arsenal were performing well in that midfield area at the moment, you do wonder how far behind the pecking order he is falling because he does need to get himself match sharp again. There's some big matches coming for Arsenal. Will we get those opportunities? I don't get the impression there's any unrest there. I don't think he's forcing for a move at all. Arsenal love him there. He's an academy graduate. But he does need to, to, to get some playing time when he gets fit again. And, and whether or not he'll get that at Arsenal in the Champions League or Premier League, we, we wait to see.